So today I'm going to be talking about jig fishing and the aspects of jig fishing. Quite a lot of us will go out, cast out, reel in and you can catch a fish. However, there's a lot of little things you can do which can give you a real edge in jig fishing. And I'm going to tell you today about the things I do which make quite a difference. So we're going to be talking about all these different types of things which will hopefully give you a really good edge in your fishing. So, first of all, we need to say what is jig fishing. So, it's a lot of different things for a lot of different people. Some people might know it inside out. Others, you may be watching this now and, and, and not knowing it at all. In a nutshell, it's getting a piece of rubber, various size, casting it out and hopefully catching a pike or a perch. But there's a lot of different things you can do with regards to retrieves, jig heads, the braids and how jigs actually work in the water column as well. So we're going to be looking at that today and uh, hopefully by the end of this, you might be able to just add some of that to your armory and catch a few more fish. There are a million and one lures on the market for lots of different reasons. There's big ones, there's small ones, and, and you use them for different reasons in different venues, different depth water, um, for lots and lots of reasons. This here is, is, a, is a, a very popular lure because of its size, you know, seven and a half centimetre, you can catch perch, pike, sander, and on there, I've got a five gram jig head. If, I'm not the best drawer, so bear with me, but let's say we've got a riverbed. This is water, the top of the water, and all the way through here, as you're, right. So five gram jig head. If I was to cast that five gram jig head out, hits the water, goes down, as it's going down, that paddle tail there, vibrations all the way down. You can get hits on a tight line and perch absolutely love a lure dropping through the water column. If I was to change that to a three gram jig head, maybe three and a half gram jig head, it's gonna go straight down, but it's gonna go slower. So rather than going fast all the way down to the bottom, it's gonna go a lot slower. And what that does is on particular days, the perch and the pike absolutely love that lure when it's coming down through that water column. So if you can change that jig head just to have a slower drop as it comes through, it can really make the difference between catching fish. You can still catch them on the, uh, on the, on the five gram jig head, but you're, you're just not putting it where they are because quite often they can be hanging up, especially perch. They can be moving up and down in that water column um, because of the temperatures of the water. So all you need to do then is, is make it hang on the dinner table a little bit longer by just changing that jig head. So it makes a really big difference just changing that jig head around. Then you've got the fact that with that jig head, once it does get down to the bottom, Couple of turns, stop. Couple of turns, stop. And what happens is the jig head on the bottom, two or three turns, it comes up and it's down. Comes up and it's down. With a five gram, it comes up and down, up and down. Three gram jig head, up and down, up and down. And perch will pick those lures off the bottom sometimes if you put pauses in between, but they love that little bit here. A little sweet spot just as it's on its way back down. They know that that fish is there like that, there like that. It's away from them, it's going down. It can grab that fish straight there like that and you've got a really good lip hook on that, on that particular fish there. So changing jig heads to suit the environment can be absolutely crucial. And that's why you've always got to ring the changes and have plenty of jig heads, plenty of different color lures as well. So you can change the color and the jig head and that can make a big difference on tough days. So we've covered briefly about jig heads and the different drops and speed of drops you can get on your lures. So you can use that to lots of different, different extremes and changing it around and finding what works best for you on your venues. But one thing some people probably don't consider as much as jig heads is the actual braid. So um, let's put this here. So the little braid. So let's go back to this one again kind of a bread and butter lure to catch the pike, the perch, sander. We might have 10 pound braid. So let's do a little, 
fantastic river. Yeah, definitely a river this time. So let's close that. If we had, uh, let's have our little. Uh, so let's say, for example, we had ten pound braid, and we and we had it on there. Uh, and we had some fluoro going straight through, maybe eight pound fluoro, six pound fluoro. Uh, as we cast out the lure, as it hits the water, so it splashes into the water, and, and, and it's got that 10 pound braid on, and it, the braid has got resistance due to the, the diameter of it, okay? So all the different braids, when you look at them, they might be 0 0.10, 0 0.12, uh, etc. as they get thicker and thicker and thicker. So as you would expect, as it falls through the water column on a tight line, it's holding back your lure. So not only can you change that lure size, you can change the braid, you can change the jig head. So there's three different things there that you can think about to be able to get that drop that you want on the particular day. So it might be, for example, while you see lure anglers with two or three rods, they might be there because they're actually doing it for a reason so that they can work their lures through the water column. So let's say 10 pound braid, it goes in, splash, and then on a nice arc, it's just coming down nice and slowly. Now. If we were to, for example, make that braid five, six pound braid, and, and you had that on, a, on another spool or, or another rod, then you could cast in, and then what happens then is it's gonna go down, it's gonna cut through, it's a bit like a cheese wire going through cheese, if a fine cheese wire, it's gonna cut through that cheese an awful lot quicker, and it's gonna come down, you're gonna get in more contact with the lure as it goes down through, but you potentially might be coming out of the kill zone even quicker. If you go the other way and, and you went to maybe 15, 18 pound braid, then you're going to get an awful, awful lot slower and it's going to be an even slower drop again. Now, there's lots of different places. It works really well. On the canals, depending on the depth and the drop, it's probably not as beneficial as it would be if you went to one of the big reservoirs or something like this where you've got a much longer drop through the water column and they're much deeper and the fish could be an awful lot higher up. People might have echo sounders and they might see that there's a, there's a shoal of bait fish and you can see the predators off them. Well, you don't want a lure going in on, on a really fine, fine braid with, a, with a, a heavy jig head which is just going to go straight past those, bait, those predators which were around that uh, shoal of bait fish. And that's when you need to start thinking, okay, how how can I change my lure size, my jig head, my braid size, so that actually that can come through and that paddle tail as it comes through, it's just doing that maximum amount of time through that kill zone. And if you start thinking like this, what, what's my lure doing when I cast in the water, where are those predators going to be, how can I put it in front of them for longer, then you can start changing things in your tackle and, and hopefully that can pick you up a few more bites when it gets a bit tough and other anglers might just be casting, retrieving casting, retrieving. You can get lucky, but you can make your own luck if you just do these little changes in, in your lure angling. So fingers crossed a few of those little things might work for you. So here we've got a loaded pro shad, fantastic lure, 15 gram. And following on from what we've just spoken about, I see this happen quite a lot on, on all different types of venues. People cast in, chatting to their friend, turn the bay alarm, chat a little bit more, turn, and then they just start reeling and then lure. But what happens is you've, to get more fish on the bank, you've always got to be ready. So when you're casting in, close that bay alarm as soon as that lure hits that water. It's easier to close it by hand, just close it straight over and then just feel it instantly on the way down. Because if you're going to change your jig head, focus on your braid, look at your lure size, and try and keep that lure in that kill zone for as long as you can, or keeping it on the drop, but you're not actually going to be in any contact with your lure, what can happen is the pike comes along, perch, sander, they grab the lure, you've got, you've got no idea any of this is happening because you're not on a tight line. And what they do, that, that's quite a heavy weight there, and they shake. And the, and the weight of that, it's only resting, that hook. It's not been set. You haven't struck. So it's only resting. And what happens is they shake and, and the lure comes out. You may feel a little bit if it was on a semi-tight line, but if you're on a slack line, not at all, really. Um, and then it's gone and you feel it down and then you start to retrieve again. And that fish is gone, inspected. It hasn't got any hands, so it's used its mouth. And then it's gone. That's not right. And, it, and it's just shaking it out like that and it's gone. And then it's gone. And it's 
very unlikely that pike's going to go, oh, let's, I'm going to go back down there and have another bite of that lure. It's not really going to happen. You've just lost that opportunity. That fish could have been any size as well. So you could have lost the fish of a lifetime. So it's really important when you cast in, cast, bail arm, feel it down on a tight line, and then make sure if you get a take, wind set, and you're into the fish. It is literally the difference between catching and not catching fish. And I, I dread to think over the years how many hundreds and hundreds of times I have caught fish on the drop on lures by just casting. Once you start doing it and bring it, bringing it into your angling, it becomes a knee-jerk reaction. And you're casting, chatting to your friend, closing the bail arm, and in fact, you're on a tight line. And then it just becomes a way of life when you lure fish. And before you know it, that's it. It's I cast, I flick the bail arm, I feel my lures down, and guess what? I catch lots more fish on the drop. So that's definitely something worth remembering for uh, future sessions on your lures. So we've covered jig heads, popular lure size, the braid diameter, and uh, I think if we look at the, uh, the, the lure speed, okay? So, it's speed and retrieve really, because you can cast out a lure and reel it straight in, as I've said before, and you will catch fish. So, what we're talking about now, we don't wanna overcomplicate lure fishing. You could get a hook, cut a piece of elastic band, put it on the hook, put a little shot above it, cast it along the edge of a canal, underneath a little canal bridge, and you would catch perch. It, it, that's where it goes back down to. You, you could, if you put a little bit of life into it. And, um, but what we're looking at now is like the kind of fine tuning of lure fishing, which like I said, hopefully puts more fish on the bank. Um, with regards to retrieves and how you bring the lure back through the water, it varies massively because uh, it varies on the depth of the water, the color of the water, the temperature of the water, the species of fish you're fishing for, um, lots of different things. If you might be in a competition with friends or a proper competition, you might be on, out on your own, you might be just, all sorts of different reasons is why you might change your lower trees and how focused you are when, you, when you're doing your lower trees. But there's probably, a selection I could briefly talk to you about now, which will definitely put more fish on the bank for you. Um, I think you've got to remember the water temperature plays a big part in lure fishing. If, uh, if you're fishing for perch and it's in the winter, uh, you're going to slow everything down. You're going to be doing nearly static with some lures. Again, the lure trees vary on the different types of lures you do. Um, this little lure here, you know, with the, with a, little single turn in the in the summer you, you might be able to do straight retrieves so you're going to get a lot more fish willing to chase so your lure is your lure is going to come back uh, let's say this was the canal and you're casting in you could literally bring your lure back on a straight retrieve like that and that little lure's coming across like that the tail's doing all the work for you it's moving through the water column what i would suggest is if you're gonna do straight retrieves pause maybe four times as it comes across the canal or up the inside line because perch, pike, sander, they don't grab every single bit of plastic which comes through with a hook on. Lure fishing has got more and more and more popular over the last few years so they see a lot. Okay so if you're going to just keep reeling straight they're probably just going to follow and you go oh I just saw one at my feet it just turned away which is Great, gets the heart going, but it probably would have been nicer to catch it halfway through that retrieve. So you bring it along, you pause, it dips. You bring it along straight again, and then it dips, and, you, and it dips, and it dips. And, and because you're putting pauses in it, you're putting trigger points in it. And a trigger point is exactly what it is, is that's when you're gonna get that predator just commit. Because if they were chasing after a little roach like that, swimming along, it, that little roach isn't going to go, I'm just going to swim as straight as I can, as fast as I can, and hope for the best. That little roach is going to swim along and kick down. He's going to go sideways. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to mimic it, but not so much so that you're actually going to miss hook holds or anything like that. So you don't have to go overkill with it. You can just do it that, you know, I tend to cast 
tight line, feel it to the water column. I don't always feel it down. Sometimes I'll feel it halfway down, especially if I think it might be snaggy. Start that straight, straight retrieve, pause. And I don't let it pause to hit the bottom. I just let it dip. So that fish doesn't have to go all the way down. It's just a dip, a dip, a dip. And if they're following, they can hit it. And you can experiment by doing bigger pauses, slower retrieve, faster pauses, so you can change your dip as you come through. And what that enables you to do as well is it means you can work this water column, this water column, and this water column. If you know when your lure hits the bottom, you cast six. I know that I've got between zero and six to be able to do my retrieve with pauses in it, which means I can now work out roughly where they are. And once I say, I count it to four, I did three pauses, I caught a fish, stick on four, stick on three pauses, that's probably a good bet. That's definitely gonna put a lot more fish on the back. Um, and then what you can do for different retrieves, you can also let them come right down. And it's, it's like, a, I just call it a skipping retrieve, really. There's this probably a more technical name out there, but it works for me. And I let that lure come down. And, and as I said earlier, it can vary. I mean, in the winter, I might do one turn, stop. One turn, stop. The pauses in between, you could leave it for a couple of seconds, you could leave it for 10 seconds. You'd be amazed what fish will pick. It might look, not look like your lure's doing anything while it's on the bottom. It doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's a canal, a river, a lake or anything. There's undertow, there's undercurrents and everything is moving down there. It's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's another little world. And the tail's still slightly moving and it doesn't take anything for them to look at it and think, I want to know what that is now, it's not moving, maybe it's not a lure, and they can only do it with their mouth. So as long as you're on a tight line, you're going to feel that. So you can bring those lures down here, and you can literally do one turn, stop, one turn, stop, one turn, stop. But in the summer, you might want to do it faster if you're after perch, um, or in the autumn, especially if you're after pike, um, you can do, okay, so you can just do, the more turns you do, the more you lift your lure up off the bottom, and it also means what you can do is cover the ground quicker. Because if in the winter, you don't really want to be, you want to find the fish, which you can do like this with your pauses and things. But it, once you get into the, into the uh, autumn there, you can cover the ground a lot quicker. Couple of turns, stop, couple of turns, stop, couple of turns, and you can start fan casting. And once you find them, then hopefully then you can start picking apart a shoal of fish. It works for me, I hope it works for you. So we've covered an awful lot now, but what we haven't looked at is the actual venues and where the fish might be. Because you could travel on some venues, probably nearly miles to find fish. Um, on other venues, you might only have to travel a few meters to find fish. So how are you gonna know where those fish are? Well, a lot of that can come down to watercraft. Um, and getting to know your venue. So the more you go, the luckier you can get. That, that's without a shadow of a doubt. So let's say, uh, let's, let's say for example, we're, we're coming into the autumn, we're coming into October sort of time, and the leaves are starting to fall off the trees. To me, if that's a clear time, the, the silverfish are gonna be, uh, they're gonna be definitely grouping up. So if it was, um, for example, summertime and you were perch fishing and uh, those perch could be everywhere because <laughs> those silverfish are everywhere. They've all gone out to feed and they're, they're up and down canals, rivers, they're all around the lake, they're everywhere. But as soon as those leaves start to fall off the trees, they start bunching up for lots of different reasons, but one of the main thing is for predation because in numbers, they want to get to the deeper water or the silverfish will. And once they're in numbers in the deeper water, then you can be sure there's going to be predators behind them. So that's a good place to start looking for, for pike and perch and sander is that deeper water once you come into the, uh, into the actual autumn time. If we look at canals, so let's just say we've got a canal here, like that. Usually a canal actually goes like that. And quite often it can have a bit of a shallow ridge up on the side here, because this is uh, what they call the boat, the boat canal. So uh, where the canal boat channel comes through, it just naturally with that propeller off the back of the, uh, off the, back of the canal boats or any boats, because they're, they're usually relatively shallow, the canals, it just boils out a little bit of a gully. It can be a bit silty and everything, but it just boils it down. So if you're a predator and you've got 
where are you, in a canal, where are you going to, you've got ambush somewhere. So you've got to think, where can I ambush? Well, here, because anything coming across here or coming across here, it's there. Um, and it's a fantastic ambushing point. And then the sides can also be fantastic as well. So to get your lure, to cast your lure straight into here, might be a bit much. <laughs> it, it, it might be a bit much straight onto its head. You might get lucky, um, but it, it might be a little bit much. Um, ideally, it would be great <laughs> running it down the central line, but obviously you'd be stood in the water there or on the canal boat potentially. But uh, what you can do is cast straight across. You get a drop down here on the tight line. You've got a nice slow drop like we spoke about. So hopefully anything which was looking at taking anything which was coming along the sides, your lure's coming down through the water and you can potentially get a bite. However, where you're really looking for that bite and where you're really focusing and where you're probably going to come across is here. So you're bringing your lure across here. Hopefully you might get a take here. Put a little, put a little uh, trigger point into it there so it comes across dips in case one's come up and it's following and hopefully that is going to be your sweet spot in there. So, you know, on a canal, covering that water and always getting prepared for that, that uh, hit there in the, uh, in the boating channel is, is always a good one to do. Um, if you're looking at ri uh, rivers and you're looking at the lakes, then you would probably be looking more features, fallen trees, sunken branches, those types of things. Because what happens there, not only do you get the, um, the predators in there and everyone looks at those spots thinking, oh, there'll be a pike underneath that fallen tree and things like that. Well, actually, in the current climate, there's an awful lot of uh, predation in this country from otters and cormorants and various things. So the silvers will use the, the sunken trees and the undergrowth just as much as what the predators will. So in fact, they're, they're all kind of in there. Um, and it's not until dusk when they really venture out. Uh, reed beds as well, especially where you've got them which go back kind of, you know, a, a good metre or so. Those silverfish, you know, the ones which are kind of this sort of size, they'll go straight into those reed beds and they'll, they'll stay back in there because they're not going to get predated by any cormorants or grebes or otters. They can't go through the reed beds and get these size things. They'll out, outdo them in the reed beds. So what happens is, uh, let's just get my black pen and we go like this. There we go. And you've got low, I'm going to go, go green on this one. Excuse my drawing, but we've got all the reed beds here and they come away from the edge there like that. These fish, they're all in here. They're all hiding in there. When I say they're all hiding in there, you can get thousands of them in there on certain venues I know. And, uh, and, and one way of, of looking for that is up here on the water line, up there, we've got a red water line this time, but up here is, uh, you can see the cormorants and they can quite often just be sat there. They might not necessarily be feeding, but what they do is every now and again, They'll just go down and just see if one of them has ventured out from the reed beds. And when they do, they're up there. And they know, you know, they've taken an awful lot of the fish from out around the lake or the reservoir. So, yeah, they're there. So a lot of people would say, oh, I don't see any silver fish on my echo sounder if they're boat fishing or topping during the day or anything. Yeah, trust me, there's a lot more than what you think. And they're in the reed beds and they're in the snags. And at last thing on dusk, and first, first light in the morning, when they, we've still got that light level, they will come out from where they are, and, uh, and that's the prime time for you to be fishing. And if you can be using lures like this, which is gonna mimic, you catch any size, uh, you catch big perch, you catch sand, you catch pike on, on that size of lure, as well as the other one earlier. Um, if you can start fishing these, you know, because if you think about it, where, where's Mr. Pike gonna be? He's literally going to be, you know, these are in the shallows. It breaks away down here usually. He, he's just going to sit here, or she is, is just going to sit here. Because on dusk and, and, and on dawn, these come across here. Pikes looking upwards, straight back down, digest the food. Doesn't waste loads and loads of energy because it just has to sit there because he knows that they're really kind of trapped in a way. And just straight up, straight down. Easy, sit and digest food. A pike doesn't want to be chasing around the lake going, where's my next meal, where's my next meal? He wants an easy meal. And an easy meal is to find where the prey fish is and take one, sit, digest it. And if you can get those reed beds and those sunken, uh, sunken trees and use lures, which I find match the hatch, you know, this is in a, in a, a silver bleak pattern there, those types of things, you're matching the hatch. You know that the pike are going to be around that area or the perch or the zander. 
you're really kind of stacking those edges towards you for being able to catch more fish and potentially bigger fish as well if you start thinking about the whole picture and that's the jig size the lure size the braid diameter and uh, and putting it all together and fishing in the places you know in the basins off those areas there and it comes into one big picture and hopefully that big picture is putting an awful lot more fish on the bank So we've covered quite a lot of different things today from venues to jig heads and lure size and braid side and all these type of things. And um, there is actually an awful lot more <laughs> which I can talk about and we can go into a lot more detail about, but we're going to save that for another time. Um, there's a, a big thing we haven't spoken about, which is drop shotting. And, you know, that can be devastating if that, that's used in, in the right circumstances, especially if you've used your jig to find out where those fish are, then um, actually you can slow things down a little bit more and um, with the right presentation, pike, perch, sander, they can all chub, they can all be caught on, on uh, drop shot as well. So anyway, <laughs> I'll talk about that on, a, on another day. Um, I hope that it's been a bit helpful today and that you've picked up a few tips and tricks and it's got you thinking a little bit more outside of the box and puts a few more fish on the bank for you. So until next time, tight lines. <laughs>